Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking with Klaus Dona from the Philippines. You may have remembered Klaus and I did lots of interviews, probably a dozen interviews over a number of years on my old website and my old uh, uh, radio show. But now uh, I wanted to touch base with him, and somebody did their darndest to keep us from uh, contacting each other for a number of years. So, Klaus, thanks for talking today, and we'll just bring people up to date. Good morning, Steve, and good morning to your audience. Thank you. Well, Klaus, you know, you have pretty much tracked down the most out-of-place artifacts in the world. I don't think anybody has done the job you've done, and I say that with genuine uh, uh, compliments and genuine praise. So the, the thing is, is that our paths have crossed over the giants, and I don't think people understand how important this is to the history of the world. Obviously, you've been talking about it for decades. I have been talking about it, written about it. You've basically had um, not only expeditions around the world, but you've also had showings of your artifacts in Southeast Asia, etc. And the people out of this country seem to uh, receive it way better than the United States or the mind-controlled uh, archaeologists here. So... Can you just share it with the people? Nothing that would put anything in harm's way or anything, but can you share kind of what you're working on now? Uh, I'm researching here uh, hidden cities and the connection to Lemuria or uh, to the continent Mu, where the official science, uh, the official science definitely is not believing in it, but. Uh, there are so many books written about it and research is done about uh, the so-called continent Mu. And you know that they found uh, archaeological sites in Indonesia and the official age dating goes already far behind the uh, so-called flood, the, the, the story of the flood, which means at least older than 12, 13, 14 and even 20,000 years old. And uh, at the end of this month, we have a conference in uh, the south of the Philippines. Uh, several speakers are coming, also the scientists who are doing the archaeological work in Indonesia. And uh, through the technology of uh, a good friend of mine, uh, we found uh, hidden cities in the jungle of Mindanao. At the moment, is it is not so safe to go there, but uh, the conference is in a very safe area, and uh, most probably the archaeological department will assist us in the south, in Mindanao, to look for those uh, hidden cities in the jungle, and I'm quite sure that the age of these uh, buildings and structures are also very, very old and might have, and I think they have to a, con a connection to the continent Moon. That's one of the story, but there are also so many stories here about giants and little people. And in a few days, uh, we are visiting one riverbed with uh, petrified huge giant human footprints and handprints. And there are also informations about uh, giants in the size of about 15 to 17 feet found here in the north of the Philippines. I was hired by the government of Sardar to dig up the skeletons of giants. We always carried the bones and the artifacts we found into the church so they would make the skeletons disappear. And the church was always involved because they didn't want people talking. So we asked the priest, uh, uh, what are we supposed to do with the skeleton? And he said, uh, break it into pieces and bury it under the foundation of the house. I personally excavated two skeletons that were more than 10 feet tall.
happened with the Anasazi. A portal opened, a doorway, and the giants came up out of the earth. It's almost like they were eaten on the run. This was the violent overthrow of the Anasazi. Tens of thousands of artifacts were carted off to the Smithsonian's repositories, including the bones of the giants. At the turn of the 19th century, bodies of giants were turning up all over the United States. All over the island of Sardinia, there are massive stone sepulchers famed since time immemorial as tombs of the giants. Everywhere the megalithic towers stood, the tombs of the giants were close by. There may be tens of thousands of giants still buried in the soils of Sardinia today. Giants are going to return to the earth, are going to rise from the dead. There is a multi-billion dollar black market for extractable DNA from the tissue and the bones of dead giants. The stage is now set for mankind to bring about the re-emergence of the Rephaim. The enemies of God are about to become the architects of their own divine judgment. Have you talked to people that have been into the caves where a lot of the giants were, you know, basically uh, hiding out and basically some were entombed in the caves? Because aren't there just massive amounts of caves there? Uh, there are an amount of caves in the mountains. Uh, I visited uh, one already, but there is no skeleton or mummy inside. But the entrance, everything is in a very good condition, and it's from the megalithic time. That means it's thousands and thousands of years old. Right. We're we're tracking all the megalithic cities of the world, and, and especially, obviously, in South America and in Europe, and headed into Romania and the Busegli Mountains. Have you gone there? Yeah. Have you been there? No, okay. sorry, I was far away many times from my country, from Austria, but never in the neighbor countries. So that's the next step I have to do, but not at the moment. Are you finding that once the word gets out what you're looking for, are there people coming forward with uh, information or eyewitness accounts? Do you have in the Philippines at this point any eyewitness accounts of people seeing giants in the last, let's say, five to ten years? Yes, but not uh, living. Mummified, yes, and that's a very interesting story, which I'm now getting more and more information, and hopefully I might be able to see it. They found uh, a giant mummy, mummified, with a size of uh, 15 feet, and uh, this... Uh, 
giant had also um, how you call it jewelry, meaning a big breastplate made out of gold and uh, gold uh, chains and everything around it. And that remembered me on a video which I saw from uh, Iran where they found a big uh, giant, uh, mummified giants, also with uh, treasure uh, pieces, jewelry on, on them. And uh, there's a connection also to Utah. They also found uh, those mummified giants. Right. I actually know Robert uh, Shrewsbury. Shrewsbury, yes. 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 Uh, you know, I tried to interview him, and at that point, about in October, Klaus, he, he didn't want to be seen on camera. He must have changed his mind, but he was gracious to give me those drawings about five to seven years ago, maybe longer than that, of a king and a queen mummy seated on their thrones with the armor. Yeah. And the same, the same pictures I saw on video from Iran. And uh, when, when I was last time in Austria, I met a German who has the connections to these people who have those uh, giants. And I think in about one or two months, he will be in Iran and he will bring m much more material and he will uh, give it to me. So the story about the Iranian uh, king mummies, giant king mummies, uh, as uh, Michael Sala, he had a report about it, and they called him liar and crazy and everything like like we are used to. <laughs> yeah, uh, you and I have been used to that for 20 years. We are used to, we are crazy, yeah, of course. So wait until I get the material and then... Uh, I will send you also some photos because they did not find only the giants. They found also up to 3,000 artifacts. And I saw already photos uh, of those artifacts. Believe me, it's incredible. Incredible. What, are the giants that you're getting reports of and the skeletons in the Philippines, are they six finger, six toe? No. Okay. No. Because it seems like those giants are specific areas, and there's a lot of giants that aren't. But it, it seems to me, just based on our mutual investigations, that the six-fingered, six-toed individuals pretty much uh, came up out of South America. We're finding that, by the way, in the desert southwest, you know, the Four Corners region. We just met with yep. some Native American elders down there, and they routinely, yep. they routinely, Klaus, and you'll be getting a, a copy of this video, the True Legends. You'll be able to download it on Vimeo, on you know, on the Internet. Uh, the idea is very interesting. They're claiming they're opening the Stargates and that the giants are telling them they're coming back. So it's kind of fascinating. We're talking about Native American elders. And, you know, one of them's 80 years old. And he talks about they have a society of giants. And that they get together periodically at certain times a year and open the stargates and are literally getting information from the giants who claim they're coming back from out under the earth. Wow. Yeah, wow. You remember when we talked years ago about Dr. Muldashev and he went into the cave and the giant, you know, and, yeah. and this giant was in stasis, suspended animation? Do you yes. Remember? Yeah, and, and, and he was a, he's a scientist, so he wanted to see, and the monks told him he couldn't go beyond a certain point? Well, nobody believed him also. No. Even he wrote the book. He is a very famous uh, doctor, so... He had a problem, and that's when he heard uh, of the bones which I brought from Ecuador for research to Austria of the 7.6 meter giant, which is close to 25 feet. Uh, he came to Vienna to visit me because he also needs some approval. And I think your research and uh, my future research uh, can help him to approve the giant really existed. When he went into Lebanon, I think he went into the Baalbek region, uh, Persepolis, and the Russian papers carried the picture of him and the giant footprints. Did he ever mention the underground civil, the underground civilization that was under the surface there? Uh, no, not uh, when I met him. No. Okay. Well, 
at this point, have any of the people, since you're investigating Lemuria, Mu, uh, have anybody also, or have any of the people you've come into contact with brought up Yanguni off of Okinawa, the Yanguni, the uh, underwater pyramids, etc.? You, you mean Yonaguni? Yeah, uh, I, I pronounce it different, Masaki, yeah. Professor Masaki Kimura. Right. Uh, he's doing further research over there. And he found not only this structure, but also other structures under the sea level. So that means the steps there are also oversized. So that's why people say it could not be uh, man-made because the steps would be too big to move for normal people. But I think... Uh, at that time, also, people might have been much taller than in our days, oh, the yeah. Japanese. Same thing, same thing in uh, Peru, Ojantaytambo, you know, the Saksay Waman, some of those areas, the stairs, I mean, you know, it, it has to be for an oversized individual. Same thing in Turkey at Nemrat, Nemrat Dag, you know, the steps yeah. are just not human-sized steps. I can, I can send you uh, pictures from the megalith site I found here on the Philippines, uh, also with uh, big stone steps, which means uh, oversized. So the story of the giants is reality. We've we've searched our, our mutual research. I think I've been at this 40 years. You've been at it, you know, I'm 65. How old are you now? 68. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> you know, that's a good thing because I'm younger and I can learn from my elder but the thing is, is that, you know, the I see, and I think I would ask you, do you see a converging all this? Very soon, it's going to be undeniable that the giants were real, that the megalithic structures and the megalithic cities and monuments were all built by them. And what, you know, you've had hassles. They, the authorities, you know, have made it difficult for you at times. But how long will you guess it is? This is just a wild guess, Klaus. Nobody's going to hold you to it. But, uh, you know, it seems to me like things are building to a climax. I mean, there's going to be so many things found that they cannot deny it or excuse it away. Exactly. I think it doesn't take uh, much more time until the truth is out. Right. Because too many informations, as as you uh, did visit, um, you, you talked about Sardinia. Uh, there are other places all over the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it waits until understood by even the scientists. Some of them, they believe, especially here, people are very open and they are willing to cooperate. And I think, uh, if we can get out some real findings from here, especially about uh, the the hidden cities. Maybe they are connected with giants. And I just remember another thing. Uh, you know the so-called pyramid in Ecuador? Yes, sir. Manuel Palacios, uh, he, he was in the jungle in the Yanganatis. And there's a stone structure which looks exactly like a pyramid. And he informed the government and they sent out some archaeologists and geologists just for a few hours uh, visiting the place. And they decided it's natural. So it's not a pyramid. So Manuel asked me if I can uh, cooperate with him and ask uh, my German friend with his technology doing a scan over this area. And you know what we found? We found three pyramids and they are connected with a huge underground tunnel system that means in the jungle of the Yanganati you have stone pyramids and uh, some researchers found oversized uh, stone axes and stone uh, working tiles also exactly pointing out that giants lived there and were in connection with the pyramids but then think about the age of it, if there lived giants, and especially in an area where today it's a wild uh, mountain area and uh, jungle, uh, there are three stone pyramids. How built them? How many thousands of years ago? We are talking really about long, long time before. And that's one of the places 
I would like to go maybe at the end of this year or next year from here, from the Philippines, because uh, one gentleman, a very influential and uh, uh, important person of Ecuador, is willing to help me to do an expedition to the area and a real research on the spot. And I'm sure it's connected with giants again. Yeah, it's all connected to giants. Uh, I don't know if Tim told you this, but do you remember Fawcett and his expedition to find uh, El Dorado or the lost city of Z in Brazil? Exactly. Fawcett, yes, yep. in the 1920s. Yes, yes, sir. Well, basically, there have been reports now, Klaus, of live, L-I-V-E, I mean, animate giants. But what's interesting blonde-haired and blue-eyed. Now, why that's critical is there's only one place in Peru, okay, that has blonde-haired, blue-eyed people or that genome, and that's in Chachapoya, okay? So, listen to this. And you know that everybody, there's over 125 people that disappeared in that area trying to find Fawcett after that. But according to legend of both El Dorado and what he called Z, the city of Z, the pyramids were coated in gold, okay? And so all the myths and legends, as you know and I know, they all go back to a golden age, pun intended, before we're talking 20,000. We're talking maybe hundreds of thousands. For instance, the Sumerian Table of Kings, you've seen it. After the flood, normal king lies. Before the flood, Noah's flood, the biblical flood, there are guys that lived to be and reigned for 60,000 years, and they were all giants because those are the guys seated on the throne with the little people in front, you know? Yeah. So so I want to get you to back up. Now, isn't it interesting? The giants are always in the same area as the little people. What's the size of the little people that you're investigating over in the Philippines at this time? Uh, it's about a little bit over one foot. One foot? Yeah. And if I might put everybody in remembrance, Klaus was the one that broke the story about the Atacama little alien. And whenever that, you remember that? Oh, yeah, that was already 2004. 2004. And so yeah. I, I wrote a book, Klaus, called Little Creatures, okay? And yeah. what I found, just like in Hawaii, they call them the, the Manhuni, there is no place on the planet that I've investigated giants that doesn't also have a corresponding uh, legend and and uh, uh, historic accounts of the little people. Exactly. And so it's kind of funny. You and I are now, again, uh, you know, two decades, maybe three decades into our mutual research. And on one hand, we're dealing with giants. And on the other hand, they can't deny the little people. I'm talking about people smaller than the hobbits in Indonesia, you know? Yeah. That's what they are talking here, one foot. Yep. And there's a famous healer here in the town where I'm living now. And his sons told me that his father, uh, their father, waked up them sometimes at three o'clock, four o'clock and brought them outside, brought them outside the house. And they could see little people marching on the road and playing with little instruments, music. And those people are real serious people. They are not dreamers or choking me. And many other people here in Luzon, in the north of the Philippines, are approving that they saw those little people. So that means they are still alive. All over the world, when I wrote the book, Little People, I could not find one area on one continent that where there were legends of giants, there were not also little people and little creatures, you know. And obviously, the whole Irish, the British Isles of the, you know, everything from leprechauns to fairies, you know, whether people want to believe that or not. Now, obviously, there's some hoaxes out there in the archaeology world, but it's fascinating. You're hearing that in Luzon in the Philippines, even in Montana. Yeah. I live in Montana, but in the mountains of Wyoming, there was a little creature called Pedro the Mountain Mummy. And until we start yeah. talking about Pedro, then guess what? A certain government agency came in and seized the mountain mummy, okay? So the different Native Americans have the different legends. They're different legends of the, you know, the uh, little oh, creatures. Yeah. So uh, yeah. 
yeah, you know, how long ago was that encounter of the people seeing the little creatures, the the healer? Oh, that's not so long. A few years ago. What's the strangest thing you've encountered in the Philippines since how long you've been there now? A year? Uh, no, it's about twenty months. Twenty months, okay. But what's the strangest thing you've encountered to date, you personally? That's for another day when uh, the excavation here is finished. I let you know. Okay. Okay. And please, you know how I work. Anything that you're comfortable with, share. Anything you're uncomfortable with, don't share. I've learned to, you know, people say this to me too. Tell us what you really know. And my answer is, and you're free to use this, if you don't understand what I'm already telling you, what I would tell you won't help you, you know? Because, <laughs> as, as you know, there's so much... Uh, Almost people, they can believe anything on science fiction shows on TV, but they struggle over the truth. They struggle. Exactly. Yeah. Are you are you also hearing uh, uh, in the Luzon, this would be important, in the area that you're going to try and excavate or headed up in the mountains, are you seeing many connections to UFOs? I heard many stories about many, many. Many. And does it? Uh, I personally, I didn't see yet okay. anything like this. But in the area that they're describing as being the pyramid area, are the UFOs typically located in that area, or is that what the people say, or is it just broader than that? Uh, strange thing is that there are gold mines. They are gold mining in the mountains, and um, around this area, there are many of the sightings. If, and you know there are there are stories, uh, legends uh, that uh, the Japanese uh, buried amounts of gold here on the Philippines and all these stories. You right. know. Yeah, I used to get called by the people showing the same Marcos gold bar that you know for a hundred thousand they'll cut me in on a hundred million. Well, I'm here to tell you people that, you know, that part of the story is false. I, I would guess that the United States and the occupation got whatever Marcos had hidden. But well, I'm talking about the old gold, the old gold. That's what you're talking about, too. Are you experiencing, when you go into the different areas, are you experiencing any form of electromagnetic phenomenon? Oh, a very strong one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Two lines going through where I'm living now, they are very strong electromagnetic fields. Oh, these are the dogs. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Our guardians and our best friends. I got you. Well, at, at, again, the, are you saying to me that the magnetic ley lines are going through the area where you're at? Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, in all the rumors that you've investigated and all the people you've talked to, what seems to be the tallest giant or the biggest skull? Because when Timothy Alberino was in uh, Peru, they brought him into the library of old archives, you know, the conquistadors, the 1570s, and they made the statement that a standard rapier, which is I think about has a 42-inch blade from the tip to the hilt, would go through the eye socket and just barely touch the back of the skull. Have you heard any uh, stories of skulls that size? No, not yet. Okay. And what happened? No. What happened to your Ecuadorian uh, bones? Did did somebody told me that did Eric von Doniken end up with those or didn't you? Use no, 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 okay. no, no, okay. no, no, no. Some of them I still have in Vienna in a security deposit, and when I go next time to Ecuador, I will bring them back to the family of Father Waka. I got you. If are you seeing any more? Are you seeing anything in the Philippines uh, that would be similar to the Ica or Ica Peru stones? Are you finding any engravings or any uh, petroglyphs? Uh, you know, any strange. Go ahead. At the end of at the end of this month, uh, at the conference in uh, Butuan in Mindanao, there are some private collectors from the Philippines attending, and they show their artifacts they found, and there are some stones with unknown writings. But I will see them, and we can make an interview after when I return from this conference. Then I can show you also some pictures 
with my computer because today I'm talking on the iPad because I have a problem with my um, power book. But when it is repaired, then I can also show you on Skype uh, some pictures of real interesting artifacts from here, from the Philippines. Have you noticed any uh, the inscriptions you've noticed on all the different artifacts that you've located, uh, you know, reviewed around the world over the years? Are you noticing commonalities in the language or in the characters? I mean, everybody knows what Egyptian hieroglyphics look like, but not many people know what, you know, we're talking about that go beyond like 20,000 years, you know, before the flood. Or more. Yeah, or more. By the way, 265,000 years is a table of kings. Some people say it's only 235,000. I just say this, round it off to a quarter of a million years of recorded history. And they, you know, so... You know, that's, that's, that's what I'm telling people. And they say, well, they, they moved the decimal point. Listen, the Sumerians were bright people. If they know how to plot the sus- celestial coordinates, the constellations and the movement of the earth and the movement of the heavens, I don't think they have a problem moving the decimal point. But what's interesting at the point of Noah's flood, the universal flood, that's where the age of longevity absolutely stops. And then everything went into the 120 years or less. So the Table of Kings, Sumerian Table of Kings, is absolutely, in my opinion, authenticative, uh, authentic. The periods of the king's reign is authentic. And you can't claim that these are the brightest people in the world. No, somehow they made a mistake by moving their decimal wrong prior to a certain point in history. So, you know, the thing that I'm interested in has uh, the professor at Yanaguni. What's his name again? I'm sorry. Masaaki Kimura. Has he been able, at, from all of his dives and all of his investigation, has he been able to isolate any form of symbols or any form of geometric that would indicate a language? Yeah, they found uh, stone plates with uh, symbols. Okay. And some of them are very similar with uh, drawings from church work in connection with uh, the continent Mu, Mu. and also with uh, Niven, with the symbols uh, Niven found in the high valley of Mexico, uh, also on, on, on um, um, ceramic plates or, or uh, yeah, natural plates or sto- even stone plates. Right. But uh, you asked me about the connection between some writings. Uh, you know that 2001, uh, I had an exhibition in Vienna, the so-called Unsolved Mysteries, and I could present stones with uh, writing en- engraved from Ecuador, from Colombia, from Illinois, the Burroughs Cave, from Glossel, France, from Australia. It's always the same writing. And uh, the uh, former president of the German Linguistic Society, uh, Professor Schildmann, he could decipher uh, these writings. And he wrote a book about uh, those different uh, artifacts found in different uh, continents, in different countries, with always the same writing, which shows exactly that there must have been a global civilization or at least a global connection all around the world. Right. But in Glossel, the findings are officially fakes. In Illinois, Burroughs Cave is a fake. Uh, the stones from Colombia are fakes. So tell me, Steve, a very funny faker already 1900, before 1924, because the stones in Glossel were found around 1924, a wonderful figure made thousands of stones, engraves thousands of stones with an unknown writing and travels from Colombia to Ecuador to Illinois to Europe and puts them into hidden places and hopes that somebody finds them one day and get headache because he won't know what it is. No, I mean, those pieces are approval of an unknown writing. And uh, Professor Schildmann said 
He compared it, there are some similarities with the writings of the Easter Islands and also of the writings of the Hindus' Wali, Mohenjo-Daro. There is a similar similarity. That means he called it, because he said it's older than the oldest writing, the Sanskrit, he calls this, this writing pre-Sanskrit. And they found stones with the same writing all over the world. Even they found in the uh, so-called non-existing pyramids in uh, Bosnia. Uh, there are scientific researches done since the last few years, and it's a proof that there are pyramids in Europe bigger than the Egyptian pyramids and not officially uh, accepted by the official archaeologists. Uh, and even there, there is a big uh, underground labyrinth, and they found also stones with very little symbols and writings. And for me, it has definitely a similarity with those other stones found all over the world. So even now in Bosnia, and I'm sure, uh, there are many, many more findings in the near future because I think it's a very strange time. Now, really, the truth comes out fast and faster. You know, interestingly enough, now, how uh, did you say Dr. Sigmund? No, S-C-H-I-L-D-M-A-N-N. -N. Kurt is the first name, K-U-R-T, Kurt Schildmann. Is that book in German? It, it he he was a German, huh? Yeah? And yeah, he it, passed it, away. Are there a any few years ago? I beg your pardon? I'm sorry, are there any English versions of that book? Uh you can find uh, a part translation uh, translation in on internet, yes. I'm sorry, Klaus, you broke up. You can find uh, on internet uh, English translation. Okay. Just put in to Google Kurt Schildmann. I will do that. And, uh, you know, it, it, do you remember the title of it? Is it Universal Symbols or what's the title on the... No, no, no. I I have his his book. Okay. It was also written partly in German, partly in English, uh, but not here at the moment. We're tracking the universal pyramid structures around the world. Even in the Old Testament, it talks about the continents being separated in the days of Peleg, you know, Gondwana land and, uh, you know, the, yeah. the super Pangea. So all of these pyramids, I mean, people don't get it. You know, even the people that say that, well, for instance, Powell, the head of the Smithsonian, believed in isolationism when you and I know that everybody went every place on this planet. What, do you remember any of Stielman's, or, you know, forgive my pronunciation, what was his finding that it was a universal language by a universal uh, a, a, a civilization of giants? Maybe. Okay. What was, the most, what, yeah, what was the most profound thing he said that you got out of reading his book? Uh, he, he, the translation of some of those stones are really, uh, you could say, talking about extraterrestrials. Okay, so, and that's again... Action with flying objects. The, the, you, when was the last time you were in Peru? Peru was 2008 or nine. When Tim and my film crew were down there for the True Legends, the second... I'm sorry, the first, uh, yeah, the first volume, uh, first edition, when they got to the Bolivian border, you know, right in the area of Punapunco, the, the interesting thing was a Bolivian military had moved in big time. And then I checked with some people and they claimed, do you know this or have you heard this? That an entire, if you will, underground city of pyramids and giants were found and they didn't know what to deal with it. So the United States government sent their, quote, experts down there. And this was just a year ago. Have you heard that? No, not yet. Okay. Well, so but 
I believe that there are such things there, definitely. You know, getting you brought up Easter Island a moment ago. Easter Island and the Moai, you know, it, it didn't seem it, it didn't seem strange to you that no one ever dug down beyond just the head. You know, when they excavated that, I maintained that those were life size. I maintained that the Nemrod statues are life size. I maintained that the uh, uh, Karnak in Egypt are life size. The, the pharaohs. I maintain all this stuff was life size. Steve, you mentioned the Easter Island. Uh, about three years ago, uh, I was considering about uh, the huge Moais and uh, I asked my German friend, uh, why don't we try to, to check over the Easter Island if there is something underground except the Moais? And he did a scan over the area with his technology and always behind, in a certain distance, behind those Moais, he found an underground cave because he found bones, he found precious stones, and he found gold. That means definitely graves. Very deep underground, but you know also the excavations of some of the Moais are going really deep under the earth. So, then I was remembering the book of Thor Heyerdahl, the Norwegian uh, researcher. And I took his book from 1956. He did the first scientific expedition to the Easter Islands. Right. And, and on the page five or six, he wrote, when he got friendship with some of the elders of the Easter Islands, they told him that they, their ancestors informed them or gave them, gave them the information. They told them long, long time ago, they buried the kings here. So I was thinking there is no gold digging on Easter Island. There is no precious stone digging on Easter Islands. Where comes the gold and where comes, where is, are the precious stones coming? And that's for me one of the points of the reality of the continent move because the elders told to a higher die then lo that long, long time ago they buried the kings here. And I'm sure if they really would do one of the excavations, we could give them exactly the location where some of the graves are. And they would do a deep excavation. I'm quite sure they might find giant skeletons. Well, it's also from our studies and from our talking to people, Klaus, they claim that there were tunnels. The Shinkana went all the way to Easter Island. In other words, even, you know, sub-sea. And the tunnels we're talking about aren't the ones you see in Mexico where, you know, the priests crawled through rocks to get to a certain grotto. We're talking about huge and quote-unquote giant tunnels. So that would make sense because obviously they'd want to keep their kings and all their things separated. Uh, what was also fascinating, Easter Island, they used to deny, but when they ran out of food, they ate each other out of existence, you know, and I, I'm, I don't know if you know that, but there's a, there's even a curse in Easter Island that said, may your grandmother's flesh lie rotting between your teeth, you know? And yeah, that, yeah. that was, that was denied for a long time, but it was proven. Yeah. So the yeah. giants, and this is no pun intended, but the giants appetite for human flesh basically consumed a lot of, uh, if you will, indigenous people completely out of existence. But the yeah. tunnels, the tunnels under South America, uh, you know, are, are just, they're vast. And even in the United States, you know, I remember Burroughs Cave, you know, they claim it's phony. Well, somebody sure went to a whole lot of trouble. And not only that, but in the deserts of Utah, those things in Utah, the symbols and everything are just what we're talking about. They're the same things yeah. that you experience worldwide. That tells me there was a universal written language. And obviously, 
excuse me, from the Tower of Babel, there had to be one before that whole yeah. thing happened. And yeah. it was interesting, after Babylon and the scrambling of the languages on earth, whether people want to believe or not, everything changed, and so did the writing, whether it was Sanskrit or, you know, even pre, uh, pre-flood and pre-judgment of Babylon, the, the writing changed. And it seems like the writing changed at the same time the continent separated. You know, so yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Well, you know, at this point in your life, in your career, what's the ultimate goal that you want? If you look back over your life, and I'd ask myself the same question, what do you want people to really come to grips with? Not just giants, not just ancient civilizations, but what what do you, Klaus Dona, want people to know, understand, and get a grasp on? I think I would ask the science and all the people to learn and study more the past. What mistakes were done in the past that high civilizations were wiped out? Couldn't we learn from many of the old artifacts? Learning what they did, that they were wiped out through what? Because look, Steve, if we continue treating the earth, the animals, everything like we do today, cutting down the jungles, everything, look, we destroy our earth. We destroy the future of our children and of our grand grandchildren. We are responsible. And not only through atomic bombs, we might destroy the earth, but also how we, our daily life. I'm so wonderful here in the Philippines. I tell you, you have natural food. You have people friendly. It's, it's, it's a wonderful country and with a wonderful president. Well, I'm glad to have reconnected with you, Klaus. And here's the thing. As we get closer, now that you've got, uh, you know, we've got each other's email address and stuff, if uh, if it works out for you and works out for our film crew that will be down in your area, I'd love for you to come along and, you know, obviously as our guest. And I think you would appreciate it. And I won't say on this, you know, interview with you what it's all up, but I think it will make Klaus Dona go, wow, that is worth going to. It's, it's, it's beyond, it's one thing to deal with bones. It's another thing to deal with mummies. It's another thing to deal with artifacts, but it's a way yeah. other thing. Listen, when people see their first giant, you know, the story of the pilot that flew the dead giant out of Afghanistan. We're getting yeah. reports at this point of live giants. And also we're connected in now with the whole, uh, redo faucets expedition. But I tell people this. I said, you don't realize, you know, and I would like to thank you for your efforts, your cutting edge efforts. You've been on the cutting edge and many of the things that, uh, I've written about, talked about, spoken about, always go back to you. Even when I explain the Dr. Muldashev story, which incidentally, lines up with the Dulce alien war stories under Dulce, New Mexico, and the secret base there. Muldashev, Dr. Muldashev couldn't go beyond a certain point. The people there couldn't go beyond a certain point. When they did in Dulce, they were all wiped out. They were torn to pieces by the giants that are still alive under Dulce. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Mexico. Uh, a few years ago, I was the first one who received photos from artifacts where you have extraterrestrials on them and also UFOs and everything. And I was the one, uh, you remember our past interviews, uh, I told you I won't talk about extraterrestrials and UFOs as long as I don't have any information, uh, real approval. And I got the first pictures. And uh, I presented some of them together with Nassim Haramein in a conference uh, in Germany. And I asked to the audience, no photos, no video, please. But someone did a video and he was putting it onto into Internet. You won't believe the shitstorm. Even the UFO freaks called us liar and everything. But the good thing, every bad thing has always a good thing. 
uh, when this uh, video was on internet, suddenly I got e uh, emails from Mexico, from other provinces, from indigenous people writing me and sending me photos. Look, we have such pieces already since centuries in our families. That means uh, there is something going on in Mexico concerning those artifacts. We did, uh, Nassim did age dating on two stone masks, which were glued with uh, semi precious stones uh, with natural uh, glue. And the age dating goes up to eight and 14,000 years. And I can send you some photos of uh, those pieces. You, when I saw first time the first pictures, I thought that's a, that's a hoax because they were too good to be real. And in the meantime, we know those pieces are really real. And I was talking already 2003 after my visit to Teotihuacan. Uh, I got the information from the former director of the archaeological department, um, Nestor Paredes. He told me that he found in a tunnel uh, between the sun to the moon pyramid, he found a stone box filled with uh, liquid mercury. When I told this in some of the interviews, people were laughing about me and, and I was a liar and stupid crazy. But uh, two years ago, uh, the Mexican government announced that uh, the research on an underground tunnel, which goes uh, under the Quetzalcoatl pyramid in Teotihuacan, they also found liquid mercury. And you know the stories of the Vimanas right. in the Plata, that they were using mercury for, for the possibility to fly. And you found, now they find thousands of artifacts showing UFOs in, engraved in stones and extraterrestrials and they found liquid mercury. So what's going on? I mean, now I'm also interested in the stories, not only about giants and little people, but also about the stories if there might have been visitors from outside already in the, in the past. And I'm quite sure that happened. Well, I am too, and our, we're focusing our research on, you know, stargates. And the stargates yep. are worldwide the symbol of a spiral, the legends associated with the spiral, uh, yep. the aliens, quote, coming through the stargates. What's fascinating about the liquid mercury is the Indian government, when they went to, and I'm talking, India's got some very, very smart scientists, okay? Uh, yep. And you know this, that they presented a paper from ancient Sanskrit, and they actually have the instruction books on how to build the Vimana, how to fly the Vimana, how to uh, fuel the Vimana, and it all centers around mercury. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not talking the planet, I'm talking liquid mercury. So it's fascinating because even when Hitler, I wrote a new book called uh, Empire Beneath the Ice, How the Nazis Won World War Three. you know? And, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, World War Two. Probably World War Three too, but the point is, is that Hitler was using liquid mercury as also a propellant. Now it's not just mercury you dump in a machine and you go. You've got to know how to use the, uh, you know, additional compounds. But isn't that fascinating? Isn't that fascinating? They were, they were using uh, liquid mercury for the bell, activating the bell. There was. Uh, a special liquid, a mixture, but the main part was uh, liquid mercury. And uh, I think Joseph Farrell wrote about uh, a book about the bell. And uh, there is one, this liquid is called Xerox uh, and the number. I don't uh, remember now the number, uh, but this liquid, I saw it in original. Mm. I saw it, a friend of mine in Bavaria, where the last uh, train with very important things from Berlin to Prague disappeared. A 
before the end of the war, uh, the transport list, there was, there were many, many interesting things on this list. One, for example, one crystal sky, which was owned by Himmler and which was found by uh, the SS archaeologist who was working to find um, more out about uh, the Knight Templars and the Kataras. And uh, there was also one box with this liquid Xerox and uh, he showed me uh, a metal box and it was written 1934 uh, Vorsicht radioactive which means attention radioactivity inside uh, a box of uh, lead and inside that lead box one glass cylinder this size with uh, this Xerox liquid. So it, it did exist and they used it to activate the bell. So you know there are so many things going on now. Well, listen, when, when you have time, just you know, Skype Tim and say, let's do something. But I would like to, I'll keep you in the loop when we're coming to your area, okay? And okay. maybe meet. And so, listen, Klaus, thank you. It's nice to talk to you. And boy, for some, I, I told Klaus, ladies and gentlemen, before we uh, connected, that there have been real people that have kept us from contacting each other. And I think one of the last radio interviews you did, you knew you were having problem too. I think you said, Steve, people are messing with me. You didn't say messing, but they're causing me some problems. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what? But the, I don't mind. Yeah. You know, if you don't have fear, your enemies cannot attack you right. because you don't go on the same frequency. So well, everything fine. Sorry for my bad English, but it's it was uh, 5.30 when we started, oh. and that's not the best time to do an interview yeah. early morning. Yeah, we won't do that again. I just came okay. in. I came into it, and Tim said that that we we're going to do it. And I was going. I think they're eighteen hours ahead. Well, Klaus, thank you so much. I thank you very much. Okay. And greetings to all your listeners, and hopeful uh, we can see each other one day, really, really soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you.